first invaders, merchants from Tsur and Sidon, came to the Maghreb countries, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, about 3,000 years ago. They were followed by Jews from the land of Israel, who settled in remote rural areas and urban centers, from the Libyan desert to the Atlantic coast. The Jews lived with the local Berbers and were influenced by the African rhythm of their music. There were entire Berber tribes that converted to Judaism. The Berbers fought fiercely against the Arab invaders who conquered the Maghreb about 1300 years ago. Although defeated in battle, the Berbers preserve their language and musical traditions to this day. Songs were handed down orally from one generation to the next. They were not notated, and so many have been forgotten. The Jews, too, learned the Berber songs, but few are remembered today. The Berber language is a spoken language only, with no written script. <laughs> That means good evening flower, welcome. You are coming to visit me. I welcome you happily with all my heart. The banishment of Spanish Jewry at the end of the 15th century, culminating in the expulsion of 1492, brought tens of thousands of Jews to Morocco. Bonds between Moroccan Jewry and the Jews of Spain flourished for centuries prior to the expulsion. These close ties are reflected in works of Jewish law, in the philosophy of Maimonides, in the grammatical precision of Hebrew poetry, and in Andalusian music. Yerushalayim, From the moment he opens his eyes, from the moment he starts school, every Jewish child has already internalized a yearning and love for Jerusalem. I was three or four years old. Now I'm 82. I remember that every Shabbat Papa would say, next year in Jerusalem, and drink a glass of wine. Next year in Jerusalem.
Even if they lived there for 2,000 years, it was still foreign soil to the Jews. There was a sense of uncertainty in the diaspora, as expressed in Jewish yearnings, because exile is punishment, for which one may only atone in Jerusalem. The messianism they were raised on was in the air, not only in the synagogue, but in every hymn and song. There is no song that does not mention Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is not only the symbol of renewed independence, but above all a symbol of atonement for God's chastisement of the Jewish people. <laughs> Hymns, prayers, and songs of messianic longing were composed, as well as hundreds of dirges about the fall of Jerusalem chanted on the 9th of Av, the date commemorating the destruction of the temple. Life in exile is dangerous for the Jew. Temptations abound. The surrounding environment beckons. There are fears of licentiousness, debauchery, idle pursuits, and enticing music accompanying all. What is to be done? The Jews who so enjoyed this music borrowed these melodies, adding Hebrew words and new content, thus attracting the people and making the music more accessible and more acceptable. Suddenly, the messianic values that had nourished the Jews began to take on tangible dimensions, reaching a peak with the Balfour Declaration that raised hopes for imminent redemption. Zionism fired the imagination of Moroccan Jews, who perceived it as realization of the divine promise. More than 200,000 Jews left the scenes of their childhood, their homes, and all their earthly possessions, with no regrets whatsoever. They perceived immigration to Israel as the closing of a historic circle, a return to the ideal state that preceded exile, the fulfillment of the dream of redemption. These people thrived on messianic yearnings and longings throughout their lives for generations. When they came to Israel, they really believed they had come to an ideal land, to a land in which all their aspirations would come true. Reality struck them a mighty blow there could be no harsher shattering of a dream. Shir 
I believe this song reflects the essence of that conception. This is a traditional elegy chanted by Moroccan Jewish women for centuries. Now, as we worked on it, we realized that it was originally in Hebrew, translated to Arabic, and then back to Hebrew. The circle was closed. I went with it. I felt it was like keening. And once we wept for the dead, and now we are keening for the death or the crisis of a culture. Shlomo Bar came to Israel at the age of four, just after the state was established. His family and many others were housed in one of the numerous transit camps dispersed throughout the country. The multitudes of immigrants who arrived in the late 1940s and early 1950s were settled among the northern and eastern borders of the fledgling state and in makeshift towns in the Negev, with no consideration given to their physical, spiritual, and cultural needs. This elegy is part of my memory. It's a part of my self-respect, part of my hopes. If I don't recite it, then I will die too. Oriental music is born by listening to nature. Take Oriental architecture. It's part of my culture. It's part of my very being. If I build, I would build on a slope. Oriental music is built on scales, each having its own time. There's a morning scale, an evening scale, an afternoon scale. Drums and all other instruments are part of the elements of life. Earth, air, fire and water. We are aware of and linked with these elements. We have no beginning and no end. We are asymmetrical like life itself, like a heartbeat. We are all beating steadily, not sporadically. We are round. The Western world is a square, angular world. So that's the difference. We're now playing a selection from the Arca Zamnuba that is only played in the afternoons. Music of the Near East is in a constant state of flux. Arabic music, the foundation of Moroccan Jewish music, is based on a series of modes called makams, consisting of melodies from Persia and Near Eastern countries, which are passed on by oral tradition from one generation to the next. Today, only part of this ancient musical tradition remains. In the Middle Ages, selected makams were compiled into groups called nuvas, each associated with the atmosphere and emotions of a particular hour of the day. There were 24 nuvas, one for each hour, but some have been forgotten. This excerpt from the Spehan Nuba is also sung in the middle of the night. I'm 
ਜਿੰਦਰੀ ਮੈਂ ਸੁਣ ਤੋਂ ਹਾਜ਼ਰੀ Yeshua Azulai is the descendant of a well-known family of Jewish musicians in Marrakesh. The Azulai family ensemble has performed for Arab rulers and notables in Morocco. <laughs> The first poets wrote according to the time of day. They began with a major work about the morning, another about the daytime, continuing that way until they had written for each of the 24 hours. When the words were set to music, the melody selected for them exactly matched the different times of day. Our Jewish poets studied music and put Hebrew words to the melodies. Words about the land of Israel, about our Torah. Suddenly, at one point, they were told, you have to put this all aside. We don't have to remember these things anymore. We are going to create some kind of new culture. We want to have a new melting pot for the entire nation that has returned from exile and now lives together and will create together. Whatever you had, forget it. I remember that at my wedding, my grandmother wanted to make the ululating noise called Zraret. And I told her, oh no, I'm warning you, if you do that, I don't know what I'll do. What I remember from that wedding is that my grandmother, may she rest in peace, she did it quietly, behind my back, so that Ellie wouldn't hear those Zraret. Moroccan Jewish women married at an early age, when they were essentially still children. Some wedding ceremonies prepared brides for the transition from childhood to womanhood. How old were you when you got married? Twelve. Twelve years old? Yes. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen at most. The seesaw ceremony expresses adult support for the young bride who did not always understand the significance of leaving home and becoming a married woman. I always run away always run away. I would not stay with my husband, may rest in peace. I had run to the neighbors, near my parents, near my husband's brother's wife. I'd run away every evening. Every evening I'd go somewhere else. Why did you run away? I was afraid. I didn't know what marriage meant. I didn't know how to get along in life. <laughs>
The reason for these early marriages was the fear of Arab neighbors who were infatuated with the lovely girls and sometimes kidnapped them. One method of preventing abduction was to declare the girls married, a status honored by the Arabs as well. A most traumatic kidnapping occurred in the northern coastal city of Tangier. Sulika was a beautiful young girl who often visited her Arab neighbors. In 1834, young Suleika Khachuel was abducted by an Arab neighbor who was enthralled by her beauty. And he brought her to the mayor and said that she wanted to become a Muslim. But she said that she had never agreed to it and did not want that. She wanted to be a Jew and would remain a Jew until the end. El gobernador la manda a una cárcel para seducirla y al mismo tiempo declaran si no es mora la quitan la vida. Adiós padres, madres y hermanos que me voy en presencia del rey. Su corazón se llenó de tristeza. After she was put to death, Suleika was declared a martyr, and her tragic story was handed down from mother to daughter and granddaughter as a ksedah, a story in song. Suleika's tomb in Fez is a pilgrimage site. Morocco has many martyrs' tombs. Among them, there are 25 graves of female martyrs. Those who visit the graves expect immediate reward from their saints, curing illness, finding a bride or groom, or solving financial problems. People appeal to the saint in distress and joy alike. In recent years, more and more Jews have been visiting the tombs of saints in Morocco to participate in their Hilulot. The Hilulah is a mass pilgrimage to the tomb that takes place on the assumed date of the saint's death. The Hilulah of Rabbi Amram ben Diwan attracts especially large crowds. <laughs> Songs of saintly deeds are a part of the musical repertoire that accompanies these events. The Arabs too respect Jewish saints. The Arab watchman is no less an expert in the sacred hymns than are the Jewish visitors. <laughs> Veneration of saints reflects a need for communion with God. Man believes in God, in a divine entity, but one that is distant and hard to reach. A model figure, a saint, is required whose lofty virtues make him an intermediary between man and God. When daily realities are grim, the very existence of saints constitutes a guarantee of continued survival and gives reason and purpose to life. Holy men of recent generations, like Rabbi Israel Abu Hatzerah, the Baba Sali, ascended to the Holy Land. When these saints depart this world, their tombs become sites of pilgrimage. Admiration may even begin during the saints' own lifetime. Great rabbis, such as Rabbi Kaduri, a Kabbalist of Iraqi origin, were adopted by Moroccan immigrants. Disappointment with physical conditions, secularism, and daily life in Israel 
only intensified the need for a link with the heavens, with the metaphysical. The alienation of Israeli society towards Moroccan Jews was a slap in the face. In one blow, the dream of imminent redemption was shattered. The immigrants sought comfort in their special songs, customs, saints, and holidays. Physical Jerusalem, the object of messianic yearning, was a disappointment. So the dream turned towards another Jerusalem, more spiritual, more ideal. The Yom Kippur War caused great changes in Israeli society. Survival became problematic and the myth of homogeneity exploded. Change was mandated in all aspects of life. Israelis opened up to cultural pluralism. Young people who were alienated from their traditions became curious about their ancestors and their ethnic origins. The generation gap was partially bridged as parents taught their traditional music to their children. Music that can heal wounds and firmly plant the Moroccan Jewish heritage deep within their souls. Yerushalayim 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 